Hello, everybody. Hello. Oh, it's so great to see you. Today is June the 22nd. And tonight we're going to be making this really cute gnome mug rug called My Friend Fred. I say mug rug, but it's on the larger side. Like if you've already put this together, uh, this is almost the size of a placemat. We're going to talk about that here in just a minute. Hello, everybody. I'm going to give it a few minutes for everyone to get notified if you want to join me live. If you're watching this on the replay, hello, everybody. Feel free to skip around. Uh, and don't forget, you can ask questions down in the comments section if you're on the replay. I want to thank Ms. Vicki. Thank you so much, Vicki, for hanging out and moderating the chat tonight. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. I hope, uh, I hope your evening is going well. We have thunderstorms here in Virginia. I'm hoping that we don't lose power. Uh, I'm thinking maybe the worst of it has gone through. Hopefully. Hello, everybody. I see Miss Beverly is here. Beverly, how are you feeling? How are you feeling, Miss Hazel? Hello, everybody. Come on in. Uh, okay, so before I switch the screen, if you've already printed off the free PDF, you can jump down to the description box if you haven't gotten this, y'all. There's a link. You can print this off for free. Okay, it's going to tell you everything you need to make this mug rug. Now, uh, you can do this tons of different ways, but I'm going to show you two ways to do it. And tonight we're not doing the raw edge applique pieces, although I've already done one. Uh, and I'm going to show you that here in just a second. Tonight we're going to do, and if you read this down here at the very bottom, we're going to do an exercise on a free motion quilting. This mug rug is sort of like a, a combination of two different requests. I had a request and I'm sorry, it was quite some time ago and I forget exactly who asked me. Can we do a gnome mug rug? And then someone else asked, can you do a, a live showing how to do free motion quilting and, uh, and setting up your machine? So that's what we're doing tonight. And I don't think my chat is working. Give me just a second. Hold on one second, y'all. There we go. All right. <laughs> it was freezing up. I saw that Ray's snoring. Well, you'll have to turn up the volume <laughs> on your, on your uh, computer so you can hear me better. Hello, everybody. Okay, so free motion quilting. The way I'm doing it tonight, it is free motion quilting, but we're also, one way I want you to think of it is drawing with your sewing machine, because that's basically what I'm going to be doing tonight. But it's also going to be quilting my mug rug at the same time, okay? Drawing with our sewing machine. If you think of it like that, I think it's a little less intimidating, right? And uh, I want to go over a few of the supplies that I've gotten together to set up our machine, okay? First, we're gonna take a look at what you need to make this mug rug. And I'm gonna bring over my applique version. See how big that is? <laughs> it's kind of big, right? The finished size is 10 inches across and 14 inches from top to bottom. That's almost a placemat setting, y'all. But one really cool thing, if you're not into gnomes, oh, my Aunt Anne is here. Oh, you get to hang out with me tonight. Hello, I miss you so much. I miss you. Uh, if you're not into gnomes, that's okay. This uh, layout and this arrangement with the little two and a half inch squares going around lends perfectly to put any applique in this section, right? Or make it super duper simple for yourself, right? You have a fabric that you love and you only have a piece of it left. You could just put, you know, a piece of fabric, solid piece of fabric in here and call it done, right? So it lends to like a thousand different possibilities, okay? You could uh, make the body of this mug rug and embroider someone's name in it. Thousands of possibilities. Oh, that's so cool. My aunt gets to hang out. Have y'all seen her craft room tour? We did that a little while ago. It was quite some time ago. But if you want to meet my Aunt Anne, who is hanging out with us this evening, 
She has, she was the very first craft room tour that we did. Okay, so let's go over the things you need to make this, right? You need a back fabric that is 16 by 12 inches. It is that size so that you can use the back as your binding if you want to, right? That's what I did on this one. Uh, a batting that is 14 by 10. A middle fabric, when I say middle fabric, I mean this fabric that goes right in the middle of 10 and a half by six and a half, okay? And then you need 20, two and a half by two and a half inch squares, which if you have a couple of the mini charms, you've got 20, right? You can just quickly, you've already got your pieces ready to go. All right, so if you don't want to use the back as your binding, you'll need 54 inches of a separate binding. And then uh, you might find it useful if you're gonna do the free motion quilting to have a heat erasing pen. I used my friction fine liner. Uh, you can use fabric paints, paint markers, all kinds of stuff, ink tints to color in your design if you are uh, free motion quilting it, or you could even do some play if you do the applique, right? Uh, an Elmer school glue stick, I say that because I'm a glue baster for my layers. A darning foot or a free motion foot, basically they're almost the same thing. It's just your manual might call it a darning foot, some will call it a free motion foot, and some quilting thread, okay? And then the pattern, Page two is uh, a full page tracing uh, diagram if you want to do it frame motion, and I'll show you that here in a second. Or if you want to layer your applique with like a light pad or something like that, or a silicone mat, page three is all of your template pieces. And note that these pieces have not been mirror imaged, so if you're using a fusible, you'll want to trace your pieces from the back side. Okay, so let's talk about how to put together the mug rug top because to save some time and really focus on the free motion quilting, I've already put together the mug rug top. So the first thing that I did is I sewed three of my charms, right? And just like this with a quarter inch seam allowance. And then I sewed them to the shorter sides of the middle fabric and gave those a press. And then it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of your charms for these side borders. You'll sew those together with a quarter inch seam allowance and join them to uh, the body and give that a press. And that is your mug rug top, okay? Very simple construction. That's why I, I went ahead and did that part because um, I think I think that that's pretty easy to put together this top. Now, isn't he cute? Uh, I used some recycled denim blue jeans for the body. So it kind of looks like he's got like some jean overalls on. <laughs> and on this one, I did a combination of stitches to sew down my applique. I used a blanket stitch and I used a, a smaller zigzag stitch. And then I came in and uh, did some free motion uh, just straight lines in a couple of places. So let me see if I can hold that up and you can see pretty well. And then just to finish quilting it, I did a blanket stitch right through here, right around the border. Very, very simple, right? So tonight, <clears throat> I've already put together the top. And I've already traced the second page of our pattern to get my design. And so just to let you know, I find it easier to do the quilting part or the drawing with the sewing machine after the whole mug rug top is together, okay? So I assembled the top and then I traced with my light pad the second page using my friction fine liner. And then I glue basted my layers. Right, and so uh, when I glue basted my layers, I just finger pressed them all in place because I didn't want to lose the design I had traced because this will disappear with heat. So I glue basted my layers and then just let them dry. So I did all of this like yesterday morning 
There is no wet glue going over to the sewing machine. It has been dry since yesterday afternoon, okay? All right, so let's talk about sewing machine needles. All right, tonight I'm going to be using a Smith's Universal Needle, and you'll see one's missing. <laughs> it's the size 8012. The size of your needle is going to depend so much on the type of thread you're using. Okay, if you are sewing along and doing free motion quilting and you're getting skipped stitches, you're getting big clumps of thread on the back, maybe the top thread is shredding, you're going to first look at changing out your needle for something different. You might want to bump up a size, like I'm starting with an 8012. You, uh, if you're experiencing those issues, you might want to bump up to a 9014 and see if those issues don't go away, right? And then you can look at adjusting tension and all that. You also might find it helpful, depending on your thread, uh, to check out some of these other kinds of needles, right? We have the Smith's, Smith's <laughs> uh, quilting needles. Uh, these have a little bit of a longer eye in the needle, which allows more space for your thread to go through, right? And it does prevent uh, that top thread from shredding up and breaking. So you might want to look at those. Th these were $5.99. I forget where I got them from, but I'm sure that you can find them at most like Tidewater Sewing Vacs. Joann's might have them. Um, maybe Hobby Lobby, your quilting stores, and if all else fails, you might want to look on Amazon for these, right? Same with these top stitch needles. These have a little bit of a longer hole, which allows that thread to go through a lot easier. And then uh, I've oftentimes used embroidery needles to do exactly what I'm going to be showing you tonight. So maybe you have some of these, you can give that a try. Hazel Ann said, I just found you. I'd like to catch up. Can I get the first few downloads? Absolutely. Have fun. Go through my channel. Uh, you'll find in the description box the pattern for this. But I think there's also, um, I could be mistaken, a link to a playlist for all my mug rug videos. And uh, predominantly, most of them are free. So have fun. Do some binge watching. And you'll find all the links for the patterns in the description boxes for each video. So that's a little talk about the needles. Again, I'm using the 8012. We're going to start with that tonight and see how it does. Uh, let's talk about some thread that I'm using tonight, okay? In my bobbin, I am using Superior Threads Bottom Line. This is a 60 weight thread. It's, it's very, very fine in thread. I love using it in the bobbin when I'm quilting on the long arm and when I'm quilting on my domestic machine. So I have put this in the bobbin. It is a polyester thread, okay? It's nice and strong. And then for the top, I'm using a black thread. This one's a little bit thicker. And this is a Superior Threads also. Uh -uh, uh -uh. I have YLI on there. <laughs> That's not the right sticker, y'all. Uh, Superior Threads Magnifico. I'm probably not saying that right either. M-A-G-N-I-F-I-C-O. Uh, this is a 40 weight polyester thread. And so this is what I'm gonna use in the top of my machine, okay? Ah, I'm so glad y'all are hanging out with me tonight. Thank you for stopping by. Okay, and so uh, you also might find it useful to have a quilting glove. There's all different kinds out there. And I know lots of people go to the Dollar Tree and get gardening gloves and use those. But what these do is give you a little bit more traction. Sometimes on smaller projects, I don't even use them because I can sort of grab the sides and move things around but you might find it helpful to have a quilting glove, okay? So I'm going to, because I wanted to show you this thread, <laughs> I need to thread my machine. 
Hello, hello, everybody. I gotta stand up for a second. I only have one spool of that thread, so I didn't have a spare that I could just go ahead and thread my machine with. <laughs> On my machine, I've already put my free motion foot on. Again, you might have what's called a darning foot. I know uh, I've seen lots and lots of videos of people using older machines without a presser foot at all. So if you don't have a darning foot or a free motion foot, you might want to watch some videos on that. All right, let me just thread this needle real quick. There we go. Now, a lot of uh, sewing machines have the ability to lower the feed dogs. And if you're really, really new to sewing and you're like, what are feed dogs? Those are the little teethy things. When you run your finger underneath the presser foot, you feel them that grip your fabric and move them, right? When you're taking straight stitches or whatever. A lot of machines have the ability to lower those so they're not catching your quilt at all. You can go ahead and lower your feed dog. I'm going to leave mine up tonight and we're going to just sew with it like that, okay? Yes, all around the world tonight. That is awesome. Marion said, does that include the reverse side to trace the pieces when you're using phrase, freezer paper. Nope. If you look at page three, it says they have not been mirror imaged. So if you are using freezer paper, you're ready to trace. If you're using a fusible product, you want to trace from the back side. Jerry makes a really good point because this is true. All the videos I watched, uh, they did do that. Jerry said, if you try it without a presser foot, I suggest you hoop your fabric. Yes, everyone I saw that did not have a presser foot had their project hooped. Check out some videos on it. It's very, very uh, fascinating. All right, lower the feed dogs. On my machine, I'm using just a straight stitch to do this. Every sewing machine has a straight stitch. Now, what I am going to do is lower my stitch length to zero. So it's all the way set to zero. Okay. Now, it doesn't matter about the width because I'm using a straight stitch. The needle's only wanting to go in one direction. It's not going side to side. So we're really only concerned with the straight stitch and a stitch length of zero. All right, are y'all ready to get started? Now, one of the cool things about this design is, uh, is that the same thing as a hopping foot? It might be, Jenny, on your machine. It might be. It might be. Hopefully with your hopping foot, you have a good visibility. Uh, if you're just quilting, a hopping foot is great. If you're doing something a little bit more detailed, where you're like tracing like what we're going to do tonight. Um, I don't know how big the hole is on your hopping foot, but hopefully you can see. I'm sure you can use it. All right. So tonight, this was actually my second gnome design. I designed one and he was a little itty bitty thing. <laughs> I was like, I don't really know that that's too beginner friendly. So this is actually my second design and I think he's super cute. And uh, here's the thing. If you're gonna try this for the very first time, I would super simplify it and maybe leave out the mushroom, right? The gnome is, is a good size um, to practice with. And if the mushroom is gonna be something that is intimidating for you, I would just leave it out. Right, I would maybe center him more and just leave out the mushroom till you get some practice. So one of the cool things about this design is uh, we're gonna be tracing right on the line, but
But at the end, if I've swayed off of these lines at all, it's not going to matter because we'll give it a press and those lines are going to disappear and no one will ever know. Kelly, I say zero stitch length because um, if you haven't lowered your feed dogs, they're not going to move uh, more aggressively underneath of your quilt, right? Okay. Um, yeah, one of the other things I wanted to say is this is really, really great practice, y'all, for what we call traveling. So if you're quilting and you're doing a pattern that requires lots of traveling, this is going to be a really great practice because as we work around, there's going to be some places that we have to travel back over where we've previously quilted before, right? So this is going to be a great exercise and great practice uh, for things like traveling. Good night, Anne. I love you. I love you. Thanks for stopping by and saying hello. Hug Sunny for me. All right, we're going to go ahead and move over to the sewing machine, y'all. I have it threaded now. And I'm hoping this view uh, you can see really well. Okay, we're going to move this little quilt right on over. There we go. And I'm hoping you can see. I need to move this stool so I can be up closer. <laughs> and I am going to grab this little glove. And just keep in mind that uh, when I have the sewing machine on the screen, my phone's over here. And so uh, if you're asking me questions... I won't see them until we're done. Uh, but we do have lots of really helpful people here who would love to help you. And uh, so don't not ask them, but just know that I won't see them while we're over here. And we're going to be over here for a good couple of minutes. <laughs> okay. Because I really want to take my time and, uh, and show you this method. Many of you already know this, but we have a lot of uh, first time viewers and we have a lot of people who uh, this might be their first time ever seeing this. All right. So I don't know that there's a right or wrong place to start this, to be really honest. You could start anywhere that you wanted to. So I think that I'm going to start right at his nose. We're going to go around his nose and then we'll travel up towards the top of his hat. Okay. So I have my top thread here and we're going to lower our needle right into our quilt and bring up the bobbin thread. See that? See how it popped up? It's really fine. But here's my bobbin thread and I'm just going to give myself a longer tail. I'm going to hold both of these threads and we're going right back down into that same hole. All right, and we're going to lower our presser foot. One of the main things that I want you to remember, if you remember nothing else, when you stop and you feel like you need to move your hands, make sure you stop. Take your foot off of, the, off of the foot pedal if you need to, but make sure to lower your needle down into your quilt so that uh, you don't accidentally move the quilt and you have this really long stitch, right? So anytime you feel like you need to move, stop and make sure your needle is down. Now when we get started, and I don't know if you're going to see this really good or not. I'll try to do it exaggerated. When I first get started, I'm going to take a couple of really, really, really tiny stitches and that's going to lock this thread so that we can trim these tails, right? And we won't have to worry about it coming undone. So just a couple really tiny stitches. I'm barely moving that quilt at all. See that? And then I'm going to travel just a little distance away. And at this point, we can go ahead and clip these threads. And we don't have to worry about that coming undone. 
So now we're just tracing, y'all. Okay, so uh, let's trace around his nose. See how I stopped with the needle down anytime I need to move the quilt? And now we're going to come and we're going to do this line over. One of the reasons I like these uh, polyester quilting threads is they're super strong. Uh, a lot of the times when I free motion quilt or draw with my sewing machine and I'm using a cotton thread, I get a lot of uh, breaking of threads and skip stitches and these threads are super strong. So if you're just at your wits end because of those problems, consider switching over to a polyester thread just to try and see if it doesn't solve your issues. Now we're gonna come right up to this line. And you don't have to go super fast. I watch lots of videos and people just are going, going, going as fast as they can go. I kind of like to just slow down and take my time and treat this machine like a pen. And we're just retracing this design. So now we're going to come in and we're going to do the little detail showing the little puffiness of his hat, right? And this will be our first traveling because we're going to re go back over that same line and come up to the little puff ball at the tip of his hat. Just like that, right over top of that line. And now we're gonna do his little puff ball for his hat. And now we're going to come around and we're going to go into this little curved section of his hat. I just want to make sure my microphone is working. <laughs> I'm paranoid now. Okay. And now we're going to retravel that line right back to the side of his hat and we'll come back down. And if you don't exactly stay on that line, it's okay. All right. Now we're going to come down and we'll go up and do this curved section of the hat. And now we'll come over and we're going to meet right here at his nose and then travel back on that line to come back down, okay? I have much better control moving the quilt this way, especially when traveling uh, versus side to side. So, and you might, you might figure that out uh, 
that it might be easier for you to travel uh, and have more control working front to back versus side to side. Let's go ahead and get his little beard in there. And I'm going to stitch to the top of his beard and then I'll check to see if there's any questions for me before we move on. So we're at the top of his hat. Isn't that coming along really good, right? One of the things I love about this, y'all, is that if you have the sewing machine and you have the thread, but you don't have a big stash of fabrics to do applique with, you could do this and then color in your design with fabric paint, right? So yeah, that's great. Angie said, my needle stays down when I stop. I'm still not used to that. I kind of love that feature. On my Juki, I can, there's a button I can push. And if I push the button, uh, when I stop, my needle will stay in the up position. And if I push the button, uh, and that, that sets it so that when I stop, it stays in the down position. You might have a button to switch that if you don't like that. All right, I think we're good. Hello, everybody. Brenda, I saw your quilt. It's gorgeous. All right. So now, whoops, I didn't mean to kick that. <laughs> so now we can go down and we've got his arm that he's got tucked behind his back there, right? And uh, so we'll do that. And then we'll come down. And while we're here on this side, before I travel over and finish the rest of him, we're going to come in and do the mushroom while we're over here, okay? So we're going to be traveling down this line to get to the next places. And uh, one of the reasons why I travel instead of just breaking the thread and starting over again is because traveling is much faster than cutting the thread and burying the threads. If you like to bury your threads, uh, this is gonna give me a, a much cleaner result in the end anyway, if I don't have a bunch of knots or things like that, right? And it also saves a lot of time. All right, so we're gonna do the outside of his arm. We're gonna go up and catch the side of his body. And now we're gonna travel right back down that line. To the top of his foot and we're going to come right over and we're going to do that mushroom. Here I'm going to do that little detail, the little circle right along the edge there. Uh, 
All right, so now we have all the lines of the underside of the mushroom that we can draw in there. So there's those lines, those look great, right? Now we're gonna travel over and get that bottom line at the very base of the mushroom and we're gonna come back down. And I'll worry about these two circles uh, details here in just a little bit. Now we just traveled right over that first section of the foot that we stitched at the very beginning as we came down. Traveling back over. Now we're gonna do the little bottom portion of his body. I think while we're right here, I'm gonna come up and do his arm before finishing off the foot. So go right to the beard and travel up just a little bit. And then come down the right side of that arm. And now we can travel back down and finish off the rest of his foot. All right, so guess what? All of that is done. So when you've come to a place where you want to stop, what I like to do um, and there's several different ways to do this, okay? But what I like to do is just make it super simple. Is just like when we started, I took a couple of stitches, just really, really, really tiny, tiny stitches just to lock this thread. I don't really want to create a knot though. So uh, very, very small and just a couple. And then we can raise that thread, raise the presser foot, and I'm going to grab this top thread and just hold it in my hand and form a longer loop like this, right? We can come back over, lower that needle, and pull up that bobbin thread. Sometimes it works on the first try and sometimes not, <laughs> but there's our bobbin thread. And now we're gonna go ahead and cut that and trim that top thread and we have a nice little clean finish on the front and let me show you the back this is where we first started right there but see the quilting detail on the back nice and clean right okay so uh let's start over here and we only have these two little circles left to do now ordinarily i would have just created a long jump stitch and started stitching 
but I wanted to show you a couple times how to start and to stop, right? All right, so we're going to lower the needle down into the quilts, raise the needle, and pull up that bobbin thread. We're putting the needle right back down in that same hole. And I'm going to take a couple little stitches. Now, here's an alternative. If the thought of snipping off these threads, you're like, I just don't trust that. Don't snip these off, okay? And I'll show you how to bury your threads here in just a minute. I've gone around the circle. I'm going to take a couple little stitches. One, two, three. And now we're going to jump over to this other circle. So we will have a little jump stitch to trim off, okay? Now when we start on this circle, again, we'll take tiny, tiny little stitches. One, two, three. And we're back to where we started. I don't usually like to stop and start in the same place because it does build up the thread there, even though we're doing really small stitches. So I'll travel over a little bit and stop somewhere else to prevent that thread building up in that same spot. All right, we're gonna lift up our needle. We're gonna pull the quilt away and we're gonna grab this top thread. There we go. We're gonna slide our quilt back. And now we have a big loop on the top. We're gonna to lower our needle right back down to where we stopped. Raise it up and pull up that bobbin thread. See it right there? And you can cut that off. And guess what, y'all? That is free motion quilting or drawing with your sewing machine, right? Isn't that super cute? All right, so let's bring it over here on the cutting mat. And I want to, hold on one second. Let me see if I have, I do. We can bury the threads on this because it's just an alternative way of finishing off your quilting. Hello, everybody. Does this machine have a stitch regulator? No, unfortunately I have a Juki HZL F600 and it does not have a stitch regulator on her. All right, let me just see if we have. All right. So here is that one stitch or where we started on the little circles and I left the threads without trimming them. I will trim this little jump stitch because we locked those stitches in, right? Uh, if you wanna bury your threads, you could absolutely do that as well. So here I have, this is my chenille needle that I'm using for all the things, <laughs> uh, but it has a longer, a hole in the needle which really allows for easier threading and I'm just going to take a needle threader and grab these two threads it's both the bobbin and the top thread and put them through my needle just like that and now instead of trimming off those threads we can bury them so I'm going in with my needle and I know it's going to be a little bit harder to see right next to where we stopped. And I'm traveling in the middle, right in the batting. So the needle's not coming through the back, okay? It's traveling right in the middle of those layers. And we can come out some distance away. And now we can trim those threads. So that's just an alternative way to do it. If you're uncomfortable trimming 
those threads uh, without burying those first, right? So let me turn on the iron. We can go ahead and heat him up. Because we can still see where I traced. Now I'm going to go ahead and just throw some heat on this. So all of my trace lines with my friction pen will disappear. So Teresa said, I cut out all the pieces for the applique. I think I'm going to do the free motion quilting also. You really like that. Well, you could do both, right? So on my applique version, and you see me do this in a lot of my mug rug videos. Uh, so in my applique version, I use the zigzag stitch and the blanket stitch. But you could do this stitch right inside, right next to the edge of your applique. And it is super fast. It is the fastest way to sew down applique. Now, yes, your edges might fray. A little more than they would in this version right because we've stitched down those edges and they're pretty secure right doing a free motion stitch like this with your applique is super fast but there is the possibility that you might get some more fraying on your raw edge fabric pieces right but you could combine the two and it's super quick I do that a lot in my raw edge applique All right, let's get this heating up. And then of course, y'all, when you have this, now it's just like a coloring book page, right? And you know, I love to paint on fabric. I have tons of videos showing how I do that. <laughs> did you heat up? You did. And just like that, y'all, all the trace lines are gone. And all I'm left with is my, uh, my sewing lines, right? So another tip, if you want to try this, but you're like, well, uh, I already know mine's not going to be neat. It's not going to be uh, perfect. And so you already know that you're going to get super frustrated. My biggest suggestion is to start with a thread color that matches or blends into your backing fabric, okay? So that way, if you make some boo-boos and if you don't trace, like I didn't trace exactly right on the line there, from some distance you can't see it, but close up, I can see it pretty well, see that? If that's something that's gonna really aggravate you and you're gonna give up and you know get frustrated with it, Use a thread that blends in to whatever fabric you are stitching on. And then it doesn't so much matter, right? It's not that bold. Trinita said, can we take fabric marker on fabric crayon instead? Uh, absolutely. You could use fabric crayons. You could use fabric markers. You don't have to stitch this at all. You could just trace that design with your fabric markers and you don't have to sew anything. You could do that, right? So at this point, uh, we're ready to paint. I don't know that I'm gonna paint the whole thing, but I did bring over some of my um, golden GAC 900, right? So let's just, so we have a few minutes. We went pretty quick through that. I thought that was going to take a lot longer. <laughs> and I did a lot of talking. I'm just going to pour a little bit of this fabric medium right into a tray. And let's break out. Let's see. What do we have up here? We have, hmm, we have a couple things up here. So we have uh, my Derwent Inktons paint pan. Y'all see me use this a lot. Let's pull this out. Karen says, I like the idea of painting. Me too, Karen. And then I also have uh, this watercolor palette. So uh, 
yeah, we could play with both of these. Let's do that. One of the reasons I like using fabric medium is because I feel like it bleeds a lot less than using straight up water. <laughs> uh, at least for me, it does. But you can experiment. You could just leave it just like this, right? That's super cute just the way it is. Or you could keep on stitching. You could come in and do details and all kinds of stuff with your sewing machine. So this here is just fabric medium and regular watercolor paints, y'all. I do feel like the watercolor paints might bleed some. So I'm just trying to stay away from the edges too much. But I really just wanted to show you this so that you could experiment with some of the things that you might already have. Lord knows the cost of stuff is going up. <laughs> so you might already have a watercolor palette handy. And you could use any fabric medium. It doesn't have to be the one I showed you. That's pretty, right? The cool thing about this is, uh, remember, it was like almost two years ago, you could still find that video on my channel. We experimented and we painted a giraffe with the watercolor and the fabric medium and we heat set it. Uh, you could wash this in the sewing machine. It will fade a little bit with the watercolors. But if you wait for this to dry and you heat set it, you can wash this. So just go in and I'm trying to be quick so we can test out a couple different colors, but, but I'm also trying not to be too quick so that I don't mess it up. <laughs> Now I'm not loading my brush with tons and tons of fluid. So even though I feel like it's bleeding just a little tiny bit, uh, it's not super bad. I feel like if you have a lot of fluid in your brush, chances are with this watercolor paint anyway, chances are it's gonna expand and go outside of your lines quite a bit. So yeah, free motion quilting or drawing with your sewing machine. Y'all, years and years ago when I first started quilting, uh, I didn't even know that free motion was a thing. Uh, I think that had I known that, uh, it would have made my life so much easier <laughs> a long time ago. All right, so there's some blue watercolor paint for his suit, right? Let's go in and paint the top of the mushroom. I didn't bring any water to rinse out this brush. I didn't think about that or a towel either. All right, let's switch brushes. We'll do <laughs> the top of the mushroom. We'll do that red. One of the cool things about uh, the watercolor paints is uh, they're kind of softer looking than the Derwent products. They're a lot softer actually, but I really do feel like they bleed a lot easier.
So just trying to get some color in there. And I'm not going right to the line, y'all. I'm going to let the color kind of do its thing and expand just a little bit. And I will touch up later if I need to. But this watercolor wants to grow a little bit. One of the things I will say about free motion quilting is and I'm not going to lie to you and I like being really transparent and the, my main thing is I don't want you to give up it is something that is going to require some practice it is something that for most people most people do not sit down on their first second third fourth or fifth attempt at this and do it perfectly. That's just not the reality of it. And I want you to keep your expectations uh, real. Now, you might be one of those few people who sit down and can just have the ability to do it right away. That's not the norm, I don't think. And so I really want you to be patient with yourself, okay? When you sit down and you start drawing with your sewing machine or you start free motion quilting please be patient with yourself and do it on a day where when you don't have a million other things to do where you can really just focus and have fun right and uh and do it at a time that is less stressful for you Let's see, Beverly said, what kind of watercolor paints are these? Uh, which one? Which brand? I have <laughs> like 16 different watercolor palettes. Let's see. This one. This one I got it at an art store in Vermont. Here we go. Um, I'm going to put this up so that you can see that. Uh, it's called... I'm going to spell this for you. Okay, Beverly. K-O-H-I-N-O-O-R. There's 24 colors in this. And uh, so there's four trays and then the clear cover that you can use to mix your paints. Uh, it's a color wheel. So there's all colors. I got it because it it's kind of compact and can travel very easily. Uh, I do think I put a link in that giraffe video from a couple years ago. If you have a hard time finding it by that name, uh, try to find that giraffe video that I did. Ah, Sheila, you're so smart. Sheila is always on the ball being so smart. She said, put a little bit of your water with your straw. Genius. There we go. So let's do that. So yeah, now, so I can show you a comparison. That's the watercolor paints, right? Pretty colors. This is, I'm painting on a tea stained fabric too, right? This is a tea stained muslin that I'm painting on. And uh, so the colors are not as bright as they would be if I were painting on a white fabric. So keep that in mind too. And I'll just use my jeans just to wipe them off, just like that. All right, so let's bring in the Derwent. And uh, let's see. We'll paint the base of the mushroom. How about that? Yeah, most of all, I just want you to be really patient with yourself trying this out. And if you haven't ever tried it, I, I really just sit, urge you to try it a couple of times. 
okay? Try it a couple of times and see what you think. Now this is an ink and it really throws down the color, right? Y'all have seen me use this several times. This is actually my favorite paint palette. And this paint does not want to run and expand like the watercolor paints. It will, but not as easily. And that's how I would throw some color into this design if you wanted to color it. Now, of course, like Trinita said, you have fabric markers. Uh, there's fabric crayons. Also, y'all, uh, did you know you could just use regular crayons? I have a box right here. If you want to talk about soft color, uh, this would be very, very, very soft. And let me just uh, start by saying a disclaimer. I would only do this if you never ever planned to wash this project. I have experimented so many times trying to get the color from crayons to stay after washing. Uh, and I get very mixed results every single time. Nothing is ever consistent with this. So if you use crayons, I would say use it in an art quilt that you know is not gonna get washed and then you don't have to worry about it, right? <laughs> But you could just take some regular crayons. What color do we want to do his hat? Uh, what color, Lisa? Let's choose. We'll start with green. <laughs> I think that'll show up on the screen a little bit. Very, very soft color. Matter of fact, it's going to be really hard for you to see. One of the cool things about using crayons, y'all, is there are some videos. There are some really uh, experienced quilters who use crayons in their art quilts and their projects, and they have made videos. So you could check those out. All the different techniques of using regular crayons. In your quilted projects. I'm just going to throw some color right around the edges and then I'll hold this up so you can see. And I didn't bring any paper towels because this is kind of a spur of the moment thing. But what I like to do is take a paper towel once I'm done coloring and put a paper towel down and then heat set it with my iron and it'll draw some of the waxy feel out of this. But I just want to give you some options for coloring this stuff in. I want you to use all their all of your resources. I'll come in and use a little bit of a darker green here and there like that. You can really do some shading. Like that. All right, let me hold that up so you can see it a little bit closer. See how soft that is? And in this light, uh, it really doesn't do it justice for what I see in person. Uh, but maybe you try that out too, right? So there you go, y'all. Uh, free motion quilting or drawing on uh, drawing on fabric with your sewing machine. I'm really hoping that uh, talking about the setup has uh, gotten you through. That's probably the most intimidating part, y'all, is setting up your sewing machine. What needle to use? Uh, what happens if your thread keeps jamming up or breaking or skipping. Um, so yeah, I'm hoping the very first part of this video was helpful for you. 
So that's what I would do. And I think I will finish coloring this when I have a lot better light. But isn't he super cute, right? There we go. Again, super simple design. And if this is your first time, maybe just try stitching him out. It's going to give you great practice. And uh, while it seems like a lot, uh, it's not overwhelming, even for a beginner. Do you know what I'm saying? So give it a try and let me know what you think. So um, let's see, what else do we have going on this week as we're closing up? Friday, block five of all the things. We'll be meeting at 12 noon Eastern Standard Time to do block five. I can't wait for you to see the center of my larger block five. It's gorgeous. Hello, everybody. Yeah, he's so cute, right? Uh, and of course, if you're using fabric, your applique pieces are on page three of the free download, right? So look how cute he is with his little jeans. <laughs> uh, on this one, I used uh, recycled blue jeans for his body and then some different scrap quilting fabrics, right? And then I used a gray flannel for his beard. So I don't know if you can see the texture of his beard, but it just feels super soft. And uh, yeah, so I waited to stitch down the applique until all my layers were done. So when I stitched down the applique, I did the quilting at the same time. See that? So, uh the applique actually served as my quilting too. Super cute. Allie's, yeah, I think you're like three or four hours behind me, right? I think you are in Seattle. Pat, yes. She said, I can't wait to see all the creative ways the crew makes this. I know, y'all are having so much fun. <laughs> with all the different blocks y'all are doing some really fun things with them so it's exciting to scroll through throughout the day and see what all is being posted over there ah three hours behind me yeah so it's like maybe your dinner time okay y'all so the gnome mug rug, I hope you have lots of fun with it. I really do. It's on the larger side, <laughs> right? This is almost a placemat, more than a mug rug. But it's a healthy size mug rug. And so if you're watching and you're like, what is a mug rug? Uh, mug rugs are awesome little mini quilts that uh, I like to use them. In many different ways okay I love making little art quilts display quilts that I can hang up right you could put this on the fridge you could put it on the door you could put it on your front door when people come visit it's the first thing they see right uh, and they're functional so they could be art quilts or they could be functional a lot of times I'll use mug rugs as my mouse pad at my desk and I make tons and tons and tons of mug rugs so I can always change out my mouse pad, right? To something different. I also like to use these in place of paper towels. So when we have snacks at night or sometimes my lunch I bring up here uh, or a snack during the day that I bring up here, I'll use this in place of a paper towel. And uh, if it gets messy, you can wash it, right? And it saves on paper towel usage saves you money and uh, if you haven't used things like watercolor paint you can wash these <laughs> right and uh, yeah and they make terrific gifts if you have craft booths and things like that you can make them and sell them uh, and those are a couple of functions that you can say how you can use them
Yeah, Vicki said a mug rug is bigger than a coaster and smaller than a placemat. Absolutely. Although this particular mug rug is not that much smaller than a placemat. <laughs> I didn't think about the size too much when I was designing it. Uh, but again, what's really cool is all the different possibilities for this layout. Uh, you can make your own applique patterns that fit inside. Or you don't have to put anything on the inside and just leave this as a featured fabric, right? So you can make a whole bunch of those really quickly. Okay, y'all. So this is uh, mug rug number six. Is that right? Yes. Our sixth uh, live, evening live for the mug rugs. So in July, we'll be doing another evening live. I haven't yet figured out the mug rug we're doing yet, but uh, it should be fun anyway. <laughs> And I haven't figured out what day that will be either. So if you haven't already, you might want to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you get notified when I go live and, and come hang out with us. Michelle said it will fit your tea and cookies. Yes. Yes. Linda said Fred is a cute little guy. <laughs> he is, right? Marion said, I, uh, I like the size of this mug rug because it's close to the size of a placemat. I could see more of this size. Yeah. Tracy said, either version, would you recommend finishing the backing, especially the applique? Finishing the back. The backing, I'm trying to figure out uh, before stitching down the applique. So here's the steps that I would do, Miss Tracy. And I'm not sure that this is going to answer your question. What I would do, the borders and the sides, yes. Okay, so what I would do is I would assemble the whole top. Okay, uh, start by sewing your three two and a half by two and a half inch squares, two sections of three and sew that to the middle fabric. And then assemble these portions and sew that on to your middle fabric and give it a press. And then I would put down the applique. That's how I would do it. All right. Um, for me, that's how I would do it. A lot of people might put down the applique first and then add the sewing portions after. I don't know that there's a right way or a wrong way. Trinita said, I have some videos to show you. Well, Trinita, don't send them to me tonight because I'm going to bed. <laughs> don't send me any videos tonight because I'm going to bed. And uh, and just know that if you send them to me tomorrow, I have a super busy day. Actually, the rest of my week is swamped. But if you send them to me during the day, when I take a break, I will take a look at them. How about that? Just don't send them to me tonight because <laughs> I'm trying to be going to sleep. <laughs> Teresa said that's how I did it. Yeah, you know, I don't know that there's a right way or a wrong way. And so, Tracy, whichever way makes more sense to you, I would try that way first, okay? To me, I kind of like to work with the whole mug rug assembled. But for you and a lot of people, it might make more sense to work in this middle section and then attach the side pieces, right? So I hope you have lots and lots and lots of fun with this. And uh, like we said a few minutes ago, I'm kind of excited to see what you come up with. Uh, how cute would this be on a t-shirt? If you just took the applique of, of the gnome and put him on a t-shirt instead of making a mug rug, wouldn't that be super cute? 
I think we need to think outside the box. Not just this pattern, y'all, but all the patterns. There's so much you could do. You can make pillows. You can make a whole gnome quilt. Instead of making this, you could put him on blocks. And each gnome could have a different outfit on. Right? Wouldn't that be adorable? Good night, Miss Hazel. Good night. Yeah, DV makes a really good point. It all depends if you want to hide your applique stitches. Yes. Good night, Miss Hazel. Yeah, a t-shirt would be adorable, right? It would be. So get creative. Have lots and lots and lots of fun. And if you've just jumped in, you can get this free pattern in the description box. And uh, have fun with it, okay? So I hope to see many of you uh, Friday. We're going to be doing block five. And uh, yeah, until I see you then, have a fantastic rest of your week. Okay, I love you. Thanks for hanging out with me. Oh, let's see. I upgraded to Windows 11 today, and I've been regretting it because everything is in different places. <laughs> Has anybody upgraded to Windows 11? Vicki, you're so funny. Live long and prosper. Thank you so much, Vicki, for keeping an eye on the chat. I appreciate you so much. Thank you. Sheila said, don't forget interfacing if you're doing it in a t-shirt. Sheila's always so trusty with all of the tips. She always shares all of the tips. Thank you, Sheila. Good night, everybody. I'll see y'all Friday, okay? And I'll have my eyes open on Creative Crew for some gnomes. I'm watching. Good night, everybody. <laughs>